CIA. I will say that I do work on contracts for the NSA. Oh, good. One of them is here. No, no, no. I understand calls on one of them, but the NSA does fund a lot of uh, cybersecurity research in this yes. system. Yes. This I know. And unfortunately, if you work in that field in many different capacities, you end up touching on their money here and there. So. Does their money have any special tags on it? Or is that the National Reconnaissance Office? Well, that was a joke. I, no, I know it was a joke, and I was going to say it's, it's sort of interesting in a way because they do hide their funding sources a lot. Anybody in this room that might be involved in anything at Carnegie Mellon, they will know that sometimes you don't always really know the true source of some of the funding until you get into some things. Oh, okay. In other words, they use the NSF a lot of times as a front organization for funding things that they don't want to be out in public on in terms of what they're funding. Oh, okay. I just wanted to ask just to let everyone know that nothing I say has come from anything other than like published sources. You know, I didn't get anything from Anonymous <laughs> or from uh, WikiLeaks or anything like that. Um, the trouble with undertaking a task like this is that the story is so huge and it's moved, moved so quickly. Uh, just Wednesday, the NSA director admitted to lying to the public in order to bolster the uh, uh, bolster support for the phone surveillance that we're talking about right now. And just yesterday, I checked this on the news this morning, uh, the Washington Post and the Guardian in the UK, which has done a lot of, they've done a lot of work in this, um, posted that the NSA was looking into breaking into the Tor network. And the Tor network, for those of you who don't know, stands for the Onion Router. And what it is, is it's a series of, well, it's a way to keep anonymous communication anonymous. Uh, you post something, and it gets encrypted in a series of layers, and then those layers, that whole thing gets shifted someplace else, where part of it is decrypted, shifted someplace else. So if you were to snag the information in the middle, you wouldn't be able to know what the content is, or where it originally came from, or where it originally or fundamentally is going. Uh, the NSA has been looking into breaking into that. They've had some success on individual communications, but they, as far as my understanding of the uh, reporting, uh, hasn't actually been able to crack open the whole thing and look at what everyone has been doing. Um, and that's also a uh, one of the revelations of Eric Snowden. He, he found some paperwork uh, the paperwork, I guess, is called the Egotistical Giraffe Program. There are other names for other things. So that's how quickly things move. I was writing this up for about a week, and suddenly, in the space of a couple of days, two more things were dumped on my lap. And just to let you know, I understand that given the size of the story and how quickly the story changes, I realize I'm leaving out way more than I'm including. Uh, there's a lot more to the story than I can fit into an hour uh, presentation of 40 minutes or whatever it is. Uh, I'm sure somewhere, some, somewhere, someone somewhere is working on a poli-sci PhD on exactly this that's going to take, you know, a year to, uh, uh, to research. And let me also say that I'm not actually here to defend any of the NSA programs we're talking about, uh, nor am I here necessarily to indict them, uh, well, maybe a little bit, uh, for holding to a more legalistic methodological approach I actually would like to see this more as a finding of facts uh, than an indictment either for or against. That being said, I do have to add for the record that I'm not in favor of the programs as I currently understand them. Uh, the NSA has a vast array of surveillance tools. Hi, come on in. No one knows you're here. Uh, vast, well, now they do. Yeah. Uh, the NSA has a vast array of surveillance to tools. But if anything that's learned from this talk, it's this. With great power comes the greater need for oversight, uh, if only to protect the powerless from the power, uh, from the, against the abuse of that power. While it is true that we live in a world with walls and those walls have to be guarded from those who could do us harm, it's also true that we have to, uh, we probably need to know what's going on on the other side of those walls. It is necessary for the defense of a free state in a dangerous world, I'm sorry to say. But the integrity of that free state demands that those instruments of surveillance be tightly controlled. For what would we gain if we were to lose some of our freedom in the defense of our freedom? We go a little history of the NSA. 
Um, and that's national, so, uh, national Security Agency, not the Nichiren Shoshu of America. Um, the NSA, like a great deal of contemporary American intelligence community, grew out of the intelligence failures uh, leading up to World War, I, uh, World War II. The opening pages of David Kahn's essential book on the history of cryptography, The Codebreakers, lay out in great detail the competition between the Army and Navy intelligence units, the SIS and the OP-20-G, respectively. Uh, that just before the war complicated the easy flow of intelligence about the Empire of Japan, despite the fact that the Empire's diplomatic crypto system, nicknamed Purple by American intelligence, had been broken by the SIS in the mid-30s. After the war, the AFSA, the Armed Forces Security Agency, was formed. Working under the authority of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, it was essentially to be a merger of the signal intelligence units of the Army, Navy, and the newly formed Air Force. Uh, however, it didn't last long. From the NSA's own history, uh, they're going to say, the AFA, AFSA failed for two reasons. Did not succeed in centralizing the direction of communications intelligence efforts. Uh, it largely ignored in, uh, the interested civilian agencies, the Department of State, the CIA, the FBI, and so on. The director did not have the authority to direct the military services, nor did he have the authority to suppress conflicts and duplication between the Army, Navy, and Air Force. As a result, AFSA spent most of its existence negotiating with the services over what it could do. The full extent and impact of the operational weaknesses of AFSA did not become widely recognized until the Korean War in June, beginning of the Korean War in June 1950. Within a few years after, uh, within a few years, these and other flaws in the nation's communication security became obvious. Uh, after the recommendations of the Bronwell Committee, President Truman signed an executive order establishing the NSA as a larger intelligence community, uh, large intelligence agency to deal with communications intelligence as a national responsibility rather than one of purely military uh, orientation. The interesting part, for our discussion at least, uh, is the prepared secrecy of the NSA from its inception. Uh, at the very end of the memo establishing the NSA, we find this, and this is a quote. The special nature of comment, which is the shortened version of the phrase communications intelligence, uh, the special nature of comment activities requires that they be treated in all respects as being outside the framework of other or general intelligence activities. Orders, directives, policies, or recommendations of any authority of the executive branch relating to the collection, production, blah, 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 of classified material shall not be applicable to comment activities, unless specifically so stated and issued by competent departmental agency, uh, departmental or agency authorities represented on the board. Other than National Security Council intelligence directives to the Director of Central Intelligence shall be construed as non-applicable to, to communication activities, communication intelligence activities, unless the National Security Council has made its uh, directive specifically uh, applicable to comment. Meaning that unless the NSA is mentioned specifically in any, any regulations, those regulations don't apply to NSA. Even if those regulations were intended to cover all intelligence agencies. For decades, the running gag in DC was that NSA stood for no such agency or never say anything. And it was only a few years ago that the memo itself was declassified. When uh, Khan was writing his first book, when uh, Bamford was writing his first book, the memo itself was so classified that you could not see the memo that described the framework of what the NSA was supposed to do. Uh, we've established that the NSA is a very secretive organization, but how secret are we talking here? In 1975, Elbert Snyder was on the staff as counsel of the United States Senate Select Committee, it takes a while to say this, to study governmental operations with respect to intelligence activities, AKA the Church Committee. Uh, and it was that year he was given an assignment from the CIA's website titled, uh, page there titled, Recollections from the Church Committee's Investigation of NSA, we find, and this is Snyder himself talking, I was given the task, along with a staff colleague, of trying to crack what was perceived to be the most secretive of US intelligence agencies, the National Security Agency. Unlike the CIA and FBI, which were agencies principally uh, in the committee's sites, there had been no press exposés of NSA. Our supervisor, in fact, seemed to take particular delight in pitting Pete and me against this mysterious Goliath. Quote, they call it no such agency, he said. Let's see what you boys can find out about it. 
It was the first time I'd heard the agency referred to in this way, and it was not long before I understood why. What ensued was something of an odyssey that lasted over uh, the better part of a year. It began with a series of fruitless, sometimes comical efforts to penetrate NSA's defenses. And he goes on, we began by asking the Congressional Research Service for anything, anything, on the public record that referred to NSA. The CRS soon supplied us with a one-page description. Remember, this is 1975, uh, two decades, two and a half decades or so after the NSA was established. Supplied us with a one-paragraph description from the government organizational manual and a patently erroneous piece from Rolling Stone magazine. <laughs> Striking out there, I paid visits to the Senate Armed Services and Appropriations Committees, which were responsible for NSA's annual funding. Only one staff person on each committee was cleared for NSA information, and I managed to obtain the uh, appointments with each. Both committees had budget and program data on NSA, but nothing that dealt with oversight. Neither of the staffers I interviewed was aware of NSA ever doing anything to raise oversight concerns. You've got to understand, I was told. They focus on foreign targets. Basically, they got nowhere in their investigation. Snyder goes on. In May 1975, after Peter and I had been struggling in vain for weeks, the committee received from the Rockefeller Commission a copy of, quote unquote, the Family Jewels, uh, the name given to a roughly 800 page compilation of the recollections of CIA employees who had previously been directed by the DCI, Director of Central Intelligence, James Schlesinger, to identify any post or any past abuses or improprieties in which the CIA may have been involved. Buried, buried within this infamous tome, and you can actually find this online. It takes a little while to search for it, but it's all in PDF uh, form. A lot of it's right redacted, and it's difficult to understand because it's, it's, it's in kind of uh, techno speak, you know, app sec four and things like that. But you can find it, it's now uh, declassified. Buried within this infamous tome were two references to NSA. These will become important. First was a reference to an office in New York that CIA had provided NSA for the purpose of copying telegrams. The other disclosed that NSA had asked, uh, CIA had asked NSA to monitor the communications of certain US citizens active in the anti-war movement. That was it, that's all they found. We might be getting a little ahead of ourselves here. I promise to, to get back to the telegram copying and the surveillance. At the inception, at its inception, the secret of NSA was assigned signal, signal intelligence. Uh, its job was to both protect the secret communications of the United States, as well as learn the communication secrets of, well, everywhere else. There are two separate aspects to signal intelligence that apply here. Content analysis, the intelligence that can be gained by learning the content of a secret message. Um, and traffic analysis, the intelligence that can be gained by merely uh, learning that a message had been sent uh, and or received. Let me give you an example to explain the difference. The height of World War I, French intelligence noticed that, s that suddenly, and by that I mean uh, overnight, German encryption codes had changed. Not only that, but there was a great deal of this new encrypted material flowing to the German lines. From that alone, and even though they had, at that point, no idea the content of any of these messages, they knew that something was up by the fact that so many new messages were being sent. I.e., this is the traffic. The traffic told them something that they didn't need the content to know. But what does this have to do with anything? Well, in early June of this year, journalist Glenn Greenwald, reporting in The Guardian, has done a lot of, as I said, a lot of work on this. He wrote, the National Security Agency is currently collecting the telephone records of millions of US customers of Verizon, one of America's largest telecom providers, under their top secret court order issued in April. Uh, the order itself reads, uh, it's hereby ordered that the custodian of records shall produce to the National Security Agency, blah, 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 blah. Uh, I'll just skip forward because I don't want to take up too much time with, with uh, legal speak. Uh, all call records, or this is the telephone uh, metadata story. This is the first thing. And then what the metadata was about. It was communications between the United States and abroad, or wholly with the United States, but nothing about the content. It was just the phone number, the, the, where it came from, how much time, where it was going. And then also, of course, added in the order, it's further order that no person shall disclose to any other person other than FBI or NSA um, anything about the program, other than you know, the person is actually going to compile the report or an attorney attached to it. So again, you have this 
collection of metadata along with the secrecy of not having to or not talking about anything about it. There's that term metadata again. Note how it's defined by all the outside stuff. Uh, indeed, the order goes out of its way to say it does not include substantive content of any communication. Uh, this is data for traffic analysis. But how do they get around any Fourth Amendment issues? Simple. They just say that there aren't any. Uh, from the New Yorker. This is from this summer in the New Yorker. Diane Feinstein, a Democrat from liberal Northern California and the chairman of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, assured the public earlier today that the government's secret snooping into the phone records of Americans was perfectly fine because the information it, it obtained was only meta, quote unquote, that was in quotes, meaning it excluded the actual content of the phone conversations, providing merely records from a Verizon subsidiary of whom, who called whom, when from where. In addition, she said in a prepared statement, the names of subscribers were not included automatically in the metadata, though the numbers surely could be found. Our courts have consistently recognized that there is no reasonable expectation of privacy in this type of metadata information, and thus no search warrant is required to obtain it, she said, adding that any subsequent effort to obtain the content of an American's communication, any subsequent ev uh, effort to get at the content would require a special order from the FISA court, and we'll get to the FISA court in a little bit. However, from the same article, there's a bit of a rebuttal. Public doesn't understand this is Susan Landau, a uh, mathematician and Sun Microsystems engineer. She's speaking about the metadata. It's so much more intrusive than content. Uh, she explained that the government can learn immense amount of proprietary information by studying who you call, when you call, who they call. If you can track that, you can know exactly what's happening. And she gives an example. For example, she said, in the world of business, a pattern of phone calls from key executives can, ref can reveal impending corporate takeovers. Personal phone calls can also reveal sensitive medical information. Here's the example. Uh, you see a call to a gynecologist, then a call to a cancer specialist, then a call to close family members. What do you think is going on there? Uh, and information from cell phone towers can reveal the caller's location. Metadata, she pointed out, can be so relatory uh, about whom reporters talk to in order to get sensitive stories that it can take more traditional tools to leak, to leak investigations like search warrants and subpoenas look quaint. You can see the sources, she said. When the FBI obtained obtain such records from news agencies, the Attorney General has to sign off on each invasion of privacy. When the NSA sweeps up millions of records a minute, it's unclear if any the breaks were applied. Unfortunately, as uh, Senator Feinstein said, uh, there's no expectation of privacy in the, in, with metadata. Perhaps there is, uh, perhaps there should be, but there isn't. The reason being that if you let someone else know your phone number, say the phone company, uh, then it's not a bit of information that you're expecting to be private. Therefore, no search for the information uh, by the state requires a warrant to conform to your Fourth Amendment uh, rights. Uh, if it's something that you shared with a business, say you were buying something from them, then it's no longer your information. Uh, it belongs to the business, and the, thus the business can decide to give it out or be forced to give it out. It doesn't have anything to do with you. This is nothing new, however. Walter Liggett, writing about, the, writing about Pittsburgh during Prohibition, described an inventive way the Volstead Act agents found the city's many uh, illicit hidden stills. Those are those things that um, make moonshine. And Prohibition was when you couldn't do such things. They realized that each still required a steady source of heat, too steady for a simple fire to be much use. Uh, and the only way to supply that steady heat, heat source at the time was a gas line. Uh, they got access to the locations for all of the city gas lines. We know where they would end up. If a line was found to lead to an empty barn, uh, or an empty shack, or someplace that there wasn't supposed to be anything, it was a good indication that a still was in there. Also a pretty good indication that the gas company was somehow in on the deal. They had to know that there were all these stills being made. They were putting in the gas lines to uh, empty spaces. Uh, much to the embarrassment of Andrew W. Mellon, both the Secretary of Treasury at the time and part owner of Pittsburgh's gas company. Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse nine says, what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. And oddly enough, that applies to communication security. In late August, Reuters reported, 
The Nas U.S. National Security Agency has bugged the United Nations New York headquarters. Germany's Der Spiegel Weekly said in a, uh, on, a, on Sunday in a report on U.S. spying that could further stain, strain relations between Washington and its allies. Citing secret documents obtained by fugitive former intelligence contractor Edward Snowden, Der Spiegel said that the files showed uh, how the United States systematically spied on other states and institutions. Der Spiegel said the European Union and the UN's Vienna-based nuclear watchdog, the IAEA, were among those targeted by U.S. intelligence agents. Uh, in the summer of 2012, NSA experts succeeded in getting into the UN video conferencing system and cracking its coding system, according to one of the documents cited by Der Spiegel. On the one hand, this is shocking. On the other hand, it's nothing new. In James Bamford's book, Body of Secrets, we read about how, in late April 1945, with the war in Europe still uh, ending and the war in the Pacific still raging, delegates from 50 countries descended on San Francisco to negotiate the treaty that was to form the United Nations. As Bamford writes, but the American delegates to the conference had a secret weapon. Like cheats at a poker game, they were picking at their opponents' hands. Roosevelt fought hard for the United States to host the opening session. It seemed a magnanimous gesture to most of the delegates. But the real reason uh, was to better enable the United States to eavesdrop on its guests. Coded messages between the foreign delegates, delegations and their distant capitals passed through US telegraph lines in San Francisco. With wartime censorship laws still in effect, Western Union and the other commercial telegraph companies were required to pass on both coded and uncoded telegrams to US uh, Army code breakers. In the summer of 45, the average number of daily messages had grown to almost 300,000 a day, from 46,000 in February, uh, the previous February. The same soldiers who only a few weeks early, earlier had been deciphering German battle plans were now unraveling the codes and ciphers wound tightly around Argentinian negotiating points. Uh, the San Francisco conference served as an important demonstration of the usefulness of peacetime signals intelligence. Impressive with um, impressive, not just the volume of the messages intercepted, but the wide range of countries whose secrets could be read. Messages from Colombia provided details on quiet disagreements between Russia and its satellite nations, as well as on, quote, Russia's prejudice toward the Latin American countries. Spanish decrypts indicated that their diplomats in San Francisco uh, were warned to oppose a number of Russian moves. Quote, unquote, red maneuver must be stopped at once. Uh, said one. A Czechoslovakian message indicated that uh, that, that nation's opposition to admission of Argentina, Argentina to the UN. Secret erat in principo et nunc et semper, I guess. Too bad Eric Williams isn't here. He speaks Latin. He would know what it means. Uh, I apologize for my bad uh, Latin pronunciation. It means, as it was in the beginning, as it ever shall be. On August 5th, Reuters reported the Secretive Drug Enforcement Administration Unit is funneling information from intelligence intercepts, wiretaps, informants, and a massive database of telephone records to authorities across the nation to help them launch criminal investigations uh, of Americans. Although these cases rarely involve national security issues, documents received by Reuters show that law enforcement agents have been directed to conceal how much investigations truly, how such investigations truly begin. Only from defense, not only from defense lawyers, but also sometimes from prosecutors and, and uh, judges. The undated documents show that federal agents were trained to recreate the investigative, investigative trail to effectively cover up where the information originated, uh, practice that, is, that some, some experts say violates the defendant's constitutional right to a fair trial. If defendants don't know how an investigation began, they cannot know to ask uh, to review potential sources of exculpatory evidence, information that could reveal entrapment, mistakes, or biased witnesses. Reuters goes on to describe how it works. Federal agents in northeastern United States who received such tips describe the process. You'd be told only be at a certain truck stop at a certain time and look for a certain vehicle. And then we'd alert the state police to find an excuse to stop that vehicle and then have a drug dog search it. After an investigation was made, agents then pretended that their investigation began with the truck stop, not with the tip, the uh, former agent said. The training document 
uh, reviewed by Reuters refers to this process as parallel construction. The two senior DEA officials who spoke on, on behalf of the agency, but only on condition of anonymity, said the process is kept secret to protect sources and investigative methods. Parallel construction is a law enforcement technique we use every day, he said. It's decades old, the bedrock con concept. This is actually too true. It is a decades old concept. Again, this is nothing new. Before and during the Second World War, the Third Reich entrusted its, a great deal of its uh, communication security to a device known as the Enigma machine. Its main encryption mechanism was a series of three rotors that rotated one at a time when a letter was encrypted. There was a plug board that shuffled some of the letters before they reached the rotors. Uh, the order of the rotors could be changed as well as which rotors out of a selection would be, chose, would be used. It all effectively scrambled the alphabet with each letter and each new letter, there was a new alphabet, making the usual character analyses useless. The NSA has done an analysis on how many different settings the rotors and the plug board and so on could be set. It's approximately three times 10 to the 114th power. So you take 10, multiply it by itself 114 times, then multiply that by three, and that's the number of different settings for the Enigma machine. During the, the war, the German Navy upped its security to four rotors and significantly upped the number of possible combinations to two times 10 to the 145th power. Well, how big of a number is that? The NSA points out that there are only 10 to the 80th power atoms in the known universe. So they were pretty confident that considering the number of different settings, there were so many, no one would be able to break the machine, but it was broken anyway. We can't spend any time going into how Enigma was broken, and when and by whom, but suffice it to say it was one of the closely guarded secrets of the war. Uh, think for a moment as to why. If the Germans got wind of the fact that the Allies had access to some of the most secret communications, they might shift to an even tougher system. Uh, so the Allies had to act in such ways to take advantage of the intelligence without looking like they'd gotten it via Enigma. Uh, which brings me to my example. Early in the Second World War, German U-boats were devastating cross-Atlantic shipping. The shipping was supplying and arming the British war machine. Once the Allies knew where a wolf pack of submarines, U-boat submarines were, um, a spotter aircraft who had nothing, no idea of anything about Enigma would be sent to the area to discover uh, the wolf pack. Then the destroyers would be sent to deal with them. This was done so that if one of the submarines spotted the plane, the German high command would have reason would have a good reason uh, to believe why its location was detected and not having anything to do with the communication security had been broken, much like the DEA program with the, the truck and the drug dealers. Again, nothing new, but this may have constitutional problems of its own. Also in June of this year, The Guardian published, the National Security Agency paid millions of dollars to cover the costs of major internet companies involved in the prisons PRISM surveillance program after a court ruled that some of the agency's activities were unconstitutional, according to a top secret material passed to the Guardian. The technology companies, which the NSA says includes Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, and Facebook, incurred the cost to meet new certification demands in the wake of the ruling from the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. The October 2011 judgment, which was declassified on Wednesday by the Obama administration, found that the NSA's inability to separate purely domestic communication from foreign traffic violated the Fourth Amendment. While the ruling did concern the prison program directly, documents passed, or did not concern the prison program directly, uh, documents passed to the Guardian by whistleblower Edward Snowden described the problems the, deci the decision created for the agency and the efforts required to bring the operations to compliance. The materials provided the first evidence of a financial relationship between the tech companies and the NSA. So what was this prison? <coughs> the Guardian has a few. Uh, the Guardian has an answer a few paragraphs later, as well. Of, well, part of an answer. Prism under, operates under Section 702 of the FISA Amendment Act, which authorizes the NSA to target, without a warrant, the communications of foreign nationals believed to be not on U.S. soil. But Snowden's revelations have shown that U.S. emails and calls were collected in large quantities in the course of these 702 operations, either deliberately because the individual has been in contact with a foreign intelligence target, or inadvertently because the NSA is unable to separate, on, uh, separate out purely domestic communication. In August, The Guardian published, 
The FISA court that oversees surveillance programs found in 2011 that the National Security Agency illegal, illegally collected tens of thousands of emails between Americans in violation of the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court uh, ruling stemmed from what intelligence officials told reporters on Wednesday was a complex technical problem and not intentional violation of civil liberties. The judge wrote, NSA has acquired, is acquiring, and if the certifications and procedures now before the court is approved, will continue to acquire tens of thousands of wholly domestic communications. The exact total remained a mystery to the court. The actual number of wholly domestic communications may be higher, he wrote. The court had more precise visibility into the NSA's total internet acquisitions annually. The NSA consumed 250 million internet communications each year, according to an assessment by, by the judge in 2011. Some 9% of that was collected as the communications transit across the internet, a process known as upstream collection. The remaining 91% comes, comes to NSA from its internet service provider partners. That 91% presumably comes from Yahoo, Google, and so on. But, what, but is this new? International communication companies in bed with NSA, is this a new thing or not? If you've been paying attention to this talk, you'll already know the answer, which is, of course it's not new. If you Project Shamrock, remember L. Britt Snyder? He was investigating Shamrock, uh, and this is what he found in 1975. I can remember a clean-cut, earnest man in his early 40s who had met with me, but I do not recall his name. It was true, he said, that NSA had access for many years to most of the international telegrams leaving New York City for foreign destinations. The program was codenamed Shamrock and known only to a few people within the government. Every day, a courier went up to New York on the train and returned to Fort Meade with large reels of magnetic tape, which were copies of the international telegrams sent from New York the preceding day using the facilities of three telegraph companies. The tapes would then be electronically processed for items of foreign intelligence interest, typically telegrams sent by foreign establishments in the United States, or telegrams uh, what appeared to be encrypted. While telegrams sent by US citizens to foreign destinations were also present in the tapes NSA received, the briefer said that, as a practical matter, no one ever looked at them. When Snyder interviewed Louis Tordella, deputy director of NSA, he discovered that Shamrock Shamrock actually preceded NSA, which was created by, as we know, Truman in 1952. It had essentially been a continuation military censorship program of World War II. Copies of foreign telegram, telegraph traffic, sorry, traffic had been turned over to military intelligence during the war. And when the war ended, the, the Army Security Agency sought to have this continue. All the big international carriers were involved, Tordello said, but not one of them ever got a nickel for what they did. Tordello, Tordello went on to describe in detail how the program evolved. During the 50s, paper tape had been the medium of choice. Holes were punched in the paper tape and then scanned to create an electronic transmission. Every day, an NSA courier would pick up the reels of punched paper tape that were left over and then take them back to Fort Meade. In the early 60s, the companies switched to magnetic tape. While the companies were agreeable to uh, continue with the program, they wanted to retain the reels of magnetic tape. This necessitated NSA's finding a place to make copies of the magnetic tapes the, the companies were using. In 66, Tordella had personally sought assistance from CIA, remember this was uh, mentioned earlier, uh, to rent office space in New York City so that NSA could duplicate the tapes there. This lasted until 73, Tordella said, when the CIA pulled out of the arrangement because of concerns raised by its lawyers. NSA then arranged for its own office space in Manhattan. Tordello recalled that while many NSA employees were aware of Shamrock, only one lower level manager who reported to him personally uh, had had ongoing responsibility for the program over the years. The first person who served in this capacity had started in 1952 and continued until he reached place. Tordello recalled that years would go, sometimes go by without his hearing anything about Shamrock. It just ran on, he said, without a great deal of attention from any of them. I asked if, the, yeah, this is Snyder, I asked if NSA used the tape from Shamrock to spy on the international communications of American citizens. Tordello said, not per se. Uh, NSA was not interested in these kinds of communications as a rule, uh, he said, but he said that there were a few cases where the names of American citizens had been used 
by NSA to select out their international communications. Uh, and to the extent this was done, the take from Shamrock could also have been uh, sorted in accordance with these criteria. He also noted that the time of the Houston plan, it was considered, was being considered, the, the Nixon administration had sought to turn over Shamrock to the FBI, but the FBI did not want it. Remember, this is J. Edgar Hoover's FBI, didn't want this plan. Furthermore, we have Project Minaret, a project that collected foreign communications of some prominent journalists, senators, and civil rights activists, even Washington Post humor columnist uh, Art Buckwell. From The Guardian again, the agency went to great lengths to keep its activities, known as Operation Minaret, from public view. All reports generated from Minaret were printed on plain paper, unadorned with the NSA logo or other identifying markings, other than the stamp for background use only. They were delivered by hand directly to the White House, often going specifically to successive presidents, uh, Lyndon Johnson, who set up the program in 67, and Richard Nixon. The lack of judicial oversight of the snooping program led to the, led even the NSA's own history to conclude that Minaret was, quote, disreputable, if not outright illegal. It was, among other things, among other things the lack of judicial oversight that led, eventually, to uh, the almost as secret FISA court. But what is this FISA court? Where did it come from? The FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act of 1978, established what is known as the FISA court. It's a secret court in the sense that its deliberations and most of its decisions are kept from the public, uh, probably due to the sensitive nature of its work. Ostensibly, it, the court, it's the court that okays the uh, search warrants for those foreign individuals on US soil who are suspected of being foreign intelligence agents. It's supposed to state, safeguard uh, the rights of individual U.S. citizens. But as Glenn Greenwald has pointed out recently, when the original FISA court was enacted in 78, its primary purpose was to ensure the U.S. government would be barred from ever monitoring the electronic communications of Americans without first obtaining an individualized warrant from the FISA court, uh, which required evidence showing probable cause that the person to be surveilled was an agent of foreign power or, or a terrorist organization. However, it was amended in the past few years to into something else. Under the FAA, which is the amendment process, which was just renewed last December for another five years, no warrants are needed for the NSA to eavesdrop on a wide array of calls, emails, and online chats involving US citizens. Individualized warrants were required only when the target of the surveillance was a US person uh, or the call was entirely domestic. But even under the law, no individualized warrant is needed to listen in on the calls or read the emails of Americans when they communicate with a foreign national whom the NSA has targeted for surveillance. Unfortunately, Greenwald concludes, the way to bring actual transparency to this process is to examine the relevant top secret court documents, FISA court documents. Those documents demonstrate that this entire process is a fig leaf, uh, oversight in name only. It offers no real safeguards. That's because no court monitors what the NSA is actually doing when it claims to comply with the court ordered, uh, court approved procedures. Uh, there is no internal judicial check on uh, which targeting end up being selected by the NSA analysts for eavesdropping. The only time individualized warrants are required is when NSA is specifically targeting a US citizen or the communications which are told, uh, completely uh, domestic. So what's the solution? I have no idea, except more better safeguards. Let me say that none of the NSA revelations should be, should be surprising. Not that it's an acceptable situation, of course, but we shouldn't be surprised. As the old saying about money and politics, it's like milk on pavement. It finds every crack. The Snowden-Greenwald revelations are nothing new. What is new is the size and the scope of the programs. And we haven't even touched on echelon, uh, echelon or the NSA's alleged watering down of encryption protocols. So at this point, if you have any questions, or if you want me to reread this, I'll do that. Here. Yes. Yeah. Well, there's been the sort of defense that the NSA is only uh, wholesale collecting the metadata, not the the actual um, conversations or the phone calls. But on, on cell phones, any text message that's sent or received on a cell phone doesn't go in the data channel, it goes in the header channel, and it's technically considered metadata from, from technicians, I don't know, from uh, NSA concerns, but do you know, does anyone know whether all the text messages are being collected? 
Uh, well, obviously, it, I don't think anyone knows specifically. Uh, it's my understanding that a great deal of the communication that gets sent back and forth across the internet is scooped up. Um, and I'm talking about on the phone network. Yeah. I, well, I mean, you would mentioned the, the text messaging. Right. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Which could, if it travels internet uh, traffic and phone traffic, uh, a great deal of it is scooped up. Something I didn't mention was an earlier revelation of a special room that was set up in San Francisco, uh, one of the phone companies. Uh, the, the situation there was that phone companies actually rent space on phone lines from other phone companies. And there was a room in San Francisco, I can't remember the number of the room, uh, and someone put on NBC News or whatever a photograph of the outside of, of the room. You couldn't go in, no one could go in, phone company people couldn't go in. But there was an engineer who knew the, excuse me, knew from the machinery that went in what was being done. It was a splicer that was actually cutting into, cutting into is probably a metaphor, but they were able to gather up in real time all of the internet traffic flowing through, all of the phone traffic flowing through those telephone lines, which would include, presumably, uh, text data. Uh, the security that's being presented, my understanding from NSA, is that, well, it goes into a large vat, a large dump, and that's locked. And so there's a difference between having the information and looking at the information. You needed a warrant to look at the information, but not necessarily to have the information. But, but, but that, that, that doesn't apply to the metadata. Doesn't apply to the metadata, and yes. text messages from technicians, technical specifications are considered metadata. Do, do you know whether that's in the lockbox or not? That I don't know. I mean, there's a lot, even after I mean, looking at this for a couple months, there's a lot, obviously, every page you turn opens up three or four more other pages that are just as secret, just as old. So I, that I don't know. Any other questions? I mentioned in the last uh, sentence or so, the uh, watering down the water, uh, of the NSA encryption. Uh, this hit the news also recently. Uh, the NSA for however long decades has been on the cutting edge of uh, the encryption pro protocols being used by governments and business to keep their communication uh, private. Uh, what's happened on a number of places, uh, Kippenhahn, which is a very interesting book called, uh, I'm trying to remember the name, uh, like Breaking the Code or something. It's, it's a translation of a German book you can get in at uh, Barnes & Noble, which is where I bought it. Uh, there are there are allegations, there are rumors that when a new encryption protocol is presented uh, to the the I think it's the Standards and Practices Administration, whatever it's called, uh, they kind of look at it and they water it down in such a way that it's still very powerful for business communication, but not so powerful that the NSA can't break into it if they need to. Uh, there was one, one thing I read recently about, uh, there were some random number generators that were, this gets kind of complicated, and I probably don't, I probably don't understand vastly more about it than I do. Uh, the general idea is that if you take, say, your message, turn it into a set of numbers somehow, and then you add a random number to it, and then send that random number, then it's effectively closed. It's, the security is pretty good. You need the random number to subtract from what you've done uh, in order to decrypt the message. Well, the, the story that I re heard recently was that there was an encryption method that uh, used something called um, elliptical curves. And certain elliptical curves generated random numbers. Other elliptical curves, not so random numbers. And so the NSA kind of pointed the direction of the, which elliptical curves to be used to the ones that they themselves could break. Uh, so effectively making it, saying yes, it's, 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 it's powerful, yes, it's, you're secure, but if they need to peek in, they don't have to do that much uh, of an effort. And again, that, does, that has a historical context as well. Uh, after the Second World War, there were teams of, I guess, commandos, 
running around Europe, scooping up as many of those German Enigma machines as they could. Uh, and then what the, the British government did was they just basically handed them off to Commonwealth nations, saying, well, this is a secure, um, secu secure encryption device. Uh, if you run it this way, we'll show you how to run it. If you follow the rules, then no one will be able to know what you, you can communicate with anyone you want to, as long as they have the other thing, blah, 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 it's safe. Not telling them that before the war, they broke the machine. So if they needed to, they could easily go in with the same protocols that they used to break the German system, peek in on um, com uh, countries that were supposed to be within the British Commonwealth. So if there were supposed to be secret communications there, they were kind of, it was a con job. So the basic point of everything I was saying is that a lot of the stuff that you're hearing, yes, it's bigger in scope, and yes, it's to be concerned about, but it's nothing new. This stuff has been around for decades with, with NSA and GCHQ and, and stuff, and, and that was the point of what I was uh, trying to, to get for. Do we have any more questions? Can you go home now? Because I have 322. Okay. Well, thank you for your time. <laughs>